uh, in regards to, and my family, in regards to Apunakai, uh, my grandfather, is the same guy who brought me to church uh, when Pastor Yolano was the pastor of, of uh, Philippine Christian Fellowship. Um, I want to say special thanks out to uh, Ryan, Roel, and Tim. They're the first ones to say something. Pastor Jay, I, I can't tell you how much, how thankful I am to uh, all those who sent condolences uh, to my family. And I, I sent them to uh, let my dad and my mom and my sisters, my brother know um, that you did send your, um, your prayers. Uh, thank you, Tim. I mean, I, just even the, just the fact that you just said, um, thank you, um, Brian, our prayers are with your family. That was a lot. I want to tell you, especially that I'm not even home. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm away. I'm alone. I'm not, I wasn't even in the Philippines when uh, my grandfather passed away. Um, but uh, all those small uh, things that you've said meant a lot. Um, I think maybe because of the situation I was in. I was in Korea at the time, and uh, I was teaching, and, but I didn't have any family around me. So, and I don't think anyone knew my grandfather. Uh, my students, friends, no one knows my grandfather uh, in the Korea. So, but that, that means a lot. And so I want to say thank you. Um, um, also, I want to show some pictures of, um, I guess, uh, before I start my message today. Uh, if Hannah, could you put that up? Um, this was the uh, uh, car that uh, Apun Lakai's body was uh, transferred into the cemetery. His, if you see, his name is Evaristo um, Andres. He was born on October 26, 1918, uh, 96 years old. Um, next one, Hannah. And this is the church that he goes to. It's a small church in the middle of downtown Ordeneta, Pangasinan. Um, and it's called United Methodist Church. Um, it's really small, and, but I'm really, really thankful to be there. And the next uh, picture is, do you remember them? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm going to see if you remember. Let me just test uh, you guys. Who's the guy? That's me on the, on the left. Who's the guy right beside me? Aiden. Okay, beside him? King Kong. Okay, the two ladies right here? Bella and? Candace. And those are our students, our Korean friends two years ago. And then I also got a chance. I'm sorry, I don't have everyone's picture. You can see the rest on Facebook. Uh, but um, everyone says Hello. They miss California. They miss vessels. They say our church, my church. I'm like, that's cool. It's one, oh, you have one more? Oh, there you go. I'm sorry. Um, so there's also Grace. Um, Grace is Benick's girlfriend. Uh, Benick says hello. He calls his church his church. And it's funny, he doesn't go to, his ch to church in Korea, but he wants to go to this church. Um, I saw Jeff, um, uh, Lynn, Johnny everyone and um, I hope you guys see that you know even though you're not traveling abroad that vessels is also a venue of missions um, a chance for you to show who Jesus is when we have people from different countries different cultures coming in and um, you know that's the way God put it I didn't do anything it's really God orchestrating this so um, anyways I'm going to go straight to the message today. Um, I don't know if you're wondering what am I going to share with you? What is the main thing? Um, is it my experiences in Korea and Philippines? No, um, it's not. Um, the message today is, was very clear. And I got this through the process of me being outside of the United States. Um, before I went to Korea and the Philippines, um, I'm asking, Lord, I was already praying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I know that, you know, last year, you know, when I was leaving, the students were bawling, and I was like crying, man, this sucks. I'm going back to, you know, I'm going to leave my friends. And I was like, I don't, I don't want that to happen again because that's just an experience. I mean, you know what I mean? That ends. We meet people, we say bye. We meet people, we say bye. If that is the ultimate thing, if that is our goal, we have to understand that will end. You know, that, that can't be the goal. Um, and the Lord was, I was asking God, what do you want me to do? And, um, some, um, and this was probably a month before I went to Korea and the Philippines. And the Lord says, first of all, be still. <laughs> listen. Be still and listen. And Pastor Jay, the Lord was using Pastor Jay to speak to me. Some of you guys shared some verses 
uh, that spoke to me. And I was collecting all these thoughts. And even as I was in Korea and the Philippines, I kept writing these thoughts down from the Word of God, not from my feelings or from a sign I saw. I'm, I'm talking specifically from God's Word. So what I'm going to share with you guys is nothing new. This is not Brian's feeling. This is basically what God was touching my heart with, and I'm simply sharing with you. Okay, that's all I'm doing. I'm simply sharing with you what the message is today. Let's turn to John chapter 2. John 2. Can you turn to John 2? Okay. Um, oops. John 2. Oh, what happened? Okay, John 2, verses 13 to 25. Okay. Here we go. All right. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a, co a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Verse 20. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Verse 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Okay, um, I'm sure this message uh, is not new to you. So let me ask you, who has never heard of this story before? Raise your hand. Who has never heard of the story when Jesus clears the temple courts? Who has never heard of it? Okay, so, so I'm assuming that all of you have heard about this story um, at some time in your life, right? Um, so can I ask you another question? Um, and I want you guys to feel free to share answers out loud. Um, what do you know about the Passover? Okay, and the reason why I'm asking that is because they're talking about the Jewish Passover, and this is a time I'm really asking you guys to go ahead and share any information you know. When, I see, when you hear the Jewish Passover or the Passover, what are you talking about? What are people talking about here? Does anyone know? What do you think of? Passover. What is the Passover? Yes. That's it. Okay, so Jews uh, were released from Egypt. Yeah? Yes. Yes, yes. Anyone else? When you hear the Passover, what does that mean to you? Anyone? Yeah. Even though we're not Jewish. Oh, oh, here you go. Eliza, go ahead. The, the blood of the lamb on the doors. So who, who did that? The, who, who put the blood of the lamb on the doors? The Israelites, right? So... Why? Why would they put the blood of the lamb on the doors? So the, the firstborn, the angel of death will not come into their house. So this is my sign. Angel of death, don't come in. Okay? So they put the, uh, the blood of the lamb on the doors so that the angel of death may not come in. That's just back in Pharaoh uh, and Moses' days. Right? Well, anyways, um, I looked up online what else the Passover says and the pass what what else the Passover means and it says uh, 
the Passover symbolizes freedom from Egypt. Okay? Um, when, uh, in the Philippines, when is the Independence Day for the Philippines? Does anyone know? June 12th. We celebrate freedom from, from, from what, from what, from what? Spain. Spanish colonial rule, right? Okay. Um, in the United States, when is the Freedom Day? Fourth of July, okay? Freedom from the British colonial rule also, okay? So here, um, the reason why this is important is because this is a big, important day for the Jews, and Jesus was a Jew. So think that Jesus related to this culture. In the Passover festival, this was huge. This was a big thing. Um, and let's look at verse 13 again. So with that said, there's a big day coming. And when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is like the capital. It's like New York. It's like Manila. It's like the center of all commerce and action at that time in that area okay so if you're preparing for a big day and you're going to a big city what do you think is going to happen I, I went to Apung Lakai's um, my first time going home um, and celebrating a funeral a passing of a relative in the Philippines and I've I witnessed firsthand what Filipinos do in the culture and I guess for a whole week I was just talking to Fiji about this before coming to service. But for a whole week, people come to the house. They eat, I mean, all the way to like 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, they don't leave. Um, it's like a party all the way until the day of the funeral. Okay, they come by and they, they play, they're playing poker, mahjong, pasoy dos. I'm like, is this, is this part of it? And my dad was like, yeah, this is it. I'm like, wow. That's cool, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, as an extrovert, I'm glad that I was not alone. Um, there's some people who are like, you know, I just want my space. I'm just, I was really happy that my dad wasn't, you know, he was in a joyful mood. My uncle was also because we were so busy greeting people and laughing and hugging and meeting new people. Um, it was great. That's like the Jewish Passover. Before the Jewish Passover, there's all these celebration ha uh, events happening. And this is the time Jesus came to Jerusalem. So what do you think is happening? All these things. But Jesus entered the temple courts. In verse 14, it says, In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. This is what Jesus saw. Okay? But I think this message is not new to you, so I'm not going to dwell on that. You know about this. That's what he saw, right? And you know he was not pleased. Because the actions, verse 15. Okay? If we go to verse 15, all right, selling stuff that they shouldn't be selling. But so he came in and this is a reaction. What is he showing here? What was his actions? He what? Let's look first of first. He what? He drove him out. Get out. Okay, it's just like, get out. What else do you see? The first, the first sentence. He, he made a weapon. <laughs> you see Jesus? You know when a uh, Filipino... Filipino moms are ready to spank their children. You know, I don't know, Francisco, they, they, they kick, take their chanelas out. I mean, or they take the belt out and, you know, wrap it around. And they're, they're ready for action, okay? So look at Jesus. He makes a whip out of cords. Can you see Jesus really doing that? I don't, it's like, what? What is Jesus doing? This is what he's doing. He's making a whip out of cords. He drove people out. Um, he scattered the coins, um, of the money changers overturned the tables. So this is the action or the reaction of Jesus when he comes in and he sees what the people are doing. Okay? And you know this story. But I just want to emphasize those, what he's doing there. Okay? Next verse. Verse 16. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Okay? Does anyone know what this sign is called exclamation point why would we put an exclamation point at the end of a sentence because a person is saying is emphasizing a point okay what is jesus's point 
Stop turning my father's house into something else. All right? And I was like, Lord, I know this. We know this story. What, what is the Lord telling me? And the Lord is still saying, listen, stop. Be still before me and listen. And let me show you what he's saying, uh, what he's saying to my heart. And I pray that he's saying to yours. Verse 17, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. Remember that. Zeal for your house will consume me. Does anyone know what zeal is? Z-E-A-L. What is zeal? It is actually a noun, not a verb. Fervor. Fervor. Correct. It is like passion. Fervor. Passion. God has passion for his house. The question is, what is his house? That is a, that's a question that I want you guys to think about because this has a lot, is 100% to do with you, um, with me, with us as a church. Verse 18, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Okay? And this is how they replied. It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? Okay, so here's my question. You already know what's going to be the next verse, right? Is Jesus talking, what is Jesus, is Jesus talking about this actual house that they were selling in? Was that what Jesus was talking about? Nope. nope. Remember that. So let's go back to 2015 now. August 2015, August 23rd, 2015, which is now, what is this house he's talking about? His temple. The question is, what is the temple then? Amen. Amen. You know what the temple is? That's us. It's you. You know what the Lord is going to do? He says in verse 20, in verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. Okay, so this story is not just a story of what Jesus did 2,015 uh, years ago. This is a story of now and what Jesus has done for you now. He has actually, this, your temple, destroyed. Done. And let's remember that. This is not just a story of Jesus' anger, people selling things, and I understand um, shady Christians want to just sell. That, of course, that's there, but it's deeper than that. Please know that the Lord is talking about you. He's talking about you, every single person here. Verse 22, After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they began, believed the scripture and the words that Jesus said had spoken after my time in Korea and the Philippines this is the message that God gave me yes it is he wanted me to share this with you guys because the Lord is telling me before I went to Korea please don't make this whole trip about anything else but him last year I went to Korea also. My university sent me a business trip. This time I taught longer. And you know, trips come and go. Pastor Jay, they went to the Middle East. Wow, amazing, but they're coming back. Ruel, Neresh, you guys went to uh, Europe, right? You guys went to Europe. Guess what? They're back. We plan to go to Israel, okay, and they're back. And sometimes we get up like, oh, okay, I got to go back to work. What is life about and all that stuff. The Lord was telling me, Christian, if you're going to make this trip about meeting the students, saying hi, if that's the ultimate goal of this trip, guess what? That's going to be gone. Because you're going to the Philippines and you're going to come back. You know? That's all going to end. And I pray that everyone knows in your life, you know, um, 
People are going to say goodbye. You're going to say hello. You're going to hug people. And there's sometimes you're going to go to their funeral and you're going to say, say bye. I think going to my grandfather's funeral, being there, I can't believe how much strength. I didn't even, have, I didn't even cry. In Korea, I cried. I was in front of three, two students and I got the news from my dad. And I broke. And I just couldn't hold it anymore. Right? And my, my student, instead of me praying for them, he goes, Christian, can I pray for you? And I go, yes, please. And it's usually I pray for them. Sometimes, guys, teachers, pastors need prayer too. Let me tell you, especially leaders, because we can't fail. We fail, we're going to be... It's, it's crazy. Your spiritual leaders, Tim, Pastor Jay, myself, Chona, we need prayer too. Please pray for us. I can't tell you how much that's emphasized. You're not the only one struggling, guys brother and sister, let me tell you, we need prayer too. And you know what? I'm so glad Jesus was there for me in the Philippines. The message I want to share to you is this same Jesus who was there for Cuyamarlo, for Pastor Ilano, for my Apo, for everyone whose loved one who's passed away, the same one who's here. You know what I'm saying? These experiences that you plan to go to, these um, seminars, um, edu- um, vacations, those are great. We all need those. They come, but they go also. The Lord is telling me, I've been there. I'm going to share, Christian, share something that is about the Lord because the Lord doesn't change. And the, what I'm trying to share with you is that, guess what? He rebuilt this temple. Guess who's the temple? You are. Let's remember this. Um, a temple is not only vessels of hope or the church and the people that you see around you. He's talking about you when you're in your room and no one's looking at you. When there's no accountability, when there's no one looking at you and you can look whatever you want on the internet or talk to whoever you want or chat with whoever you want. He's talking about, you know, dude, girl, woman, man. He's talking, the temple he's talking about is you. You are the church of God. You are that significant piece. You are the ear. You are the lips. You are the elbow. You are a part of the church of the Lord, His temple. And He raised it already. We celebrate that on Easter once a year, but you know what? Jesus proclaimed it already. Destroy this temple. You already already know where the story is going, but let's pertain it to our life again. This temple the Lord rebuilt is you. You have a chance Your identity is in Jesus. Apong Lakai, Pastor Ilano, our our parents, Kuya Marlo, they've done their part. I said something in Apong Lakai's funeral that I didn't think of saying. I said it at the moment. Now it's our turn. What do you think they were doing? Were they doing some religious thing? Were they doing a Filipino cultural thing? The thing that they were doing was what Jesus planted in their hearts. Please understand that. This is what Jesus planted. He rebuilt something. You are not, your identity is not only on your sins because Jesus destroyed that. Let's everyone remember He destroyed all the things that you suffer and any vices that you have. You're not free because you're not, you were, you were sober this, this week. You're not free because you helped someone. You're not free because of good actions or bad actions. You are free because of what Jesus proclaimed, that you dis- destroy this temple. I'm going to raise it up in three days. He's talking about the body of Christ. Yes, the church vessels, the church across the street, The Christian church is the body of Christ. But you know a part of that body is you. You have to know that. He's talking about you. He rebuilt you. You don't have to live with the fears that you probably were in your family or any expectations of failure. Let me tell you something. The Lord is giving you something more deeper. He's giving Himself to you okay and what is this temple 
Let's now turn to Ephesians 2, Hannah. Ephesians 2. So we're going to fast forward in time when Paul is writing to the people in Ephesus. Ephesians 2. Can you please turn to Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. Okay. Whoops, I'm on the wrong one. Okay. Ephesians 2, verses 19 to 22. Here we go. Now, this is Paul speaking, but Paul's also, remember, he used to be Saul. This is the same guy who was Saul, and he became born again. Like, he got transformed. If Paul can go through, if Saul can be changed to Paul, so can we. I guess that's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is sending this messenger to tell us this. Verse 19. Yeah. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. Before, we were strangers. In Moses' time, we were strangers. The chosen people were the Hebrews. Okay? The covenant, the ones that God made a covenant with. We are Gentiles, meaning non-Jews. Okay? But understand, guys, the reason why there's hope because God says, now you're a part of my family. I want you to be a part of the family. The covenant now is with you. Is with you. Okay? It's with you. But Brian, I'm not a pastor. I'm like, I know you're not a pastor. Let me tell you, praise God you're not a pastor. Thank God you're not a pastor. You know the, the, the responsibilities of a pastor? Oh my goodness. It's crazy. You know, um, if the Lord is calling you to be a pastor, um, it's more than just a feeling. But guess what, guys? He's calling you to something else. may not be a pastor, but He's calling you to do something because you are part of His body. You're not insignificant at all. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Himself as a chief cornerstone. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Guys, you have a long heritage in front of you, behind you. People have died for our faith. How was Vessels of Hope made? Before Vessels of Hope, there was Philippine Christian Fellowship, and the pastor was Pastor Ilano, who was brought from the Philippines, who was a judge. He had a lot of prestige when he came here. He humbled himself before the Lord. From Tijok and to Fiji, Jesse, uh, Jordan, that was your family. How did Pastor Ilano do that? He didn't work himself to that. There was no magic. It was the Lord Jesus that touched his heart. Pastor Ilano then met the Talampases, the Bunagans, my family. I'm just, look what the Lord's doing. It's not just like, it's, it's amazing the people who preceded you for you to actually want to, to share, like, come to church and let's listen to the, to the word of the Lord. The foundation, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. But before Pastor Ilano, there were other people who were there who preached the Word of God in the Philippines, in the United States, in Mexico, in wherever you are. The people were there spreading the Word of the Lord, not just trying to be religious. It's more than just a statement. It's a relationship with this guy named Jesus Christ and I want to share you with him. Okay, or share him with you. And this is still going on. So please understand, and this, this message is saying this, please understand, don't take this for granted because you had a long heritage of people who've lived and loved before you came here. This is a very precious faith we have. Okay? But you know what a cornerstone is? He also talks about a cornerstone. Hannah, can you show her a cornerstone, that picture? Jesus himself is the cornerstone, okay? For those who are um, in construction or you know anything, uh, 
uh, if you know anything about a cornerstone, does anyone know what a cornerstone is? Does anyone know what, what's the purpose of a cornerstone? And you can share out, out loud, does anyone know what a cornerstone is? Supports others, supports the other building blocks. Okay, anything else? Cornerstone? So boundaries? A boundary? Okay, okay. Anyone else? Foundation. Okay, uh, Joseph, can I have a Kleenex, please? Thank you. Uh, a cornerstone. This is, uh, I got this definition. The cornerstone or foundation stone um, is a concept derived from the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. It's important since all other stones will be set in reference to this stone. It determines the position of the entire structure. Okay? The whole building is set in reference to this stone, the cornerstone. And in the Christian faith, in our faith, guys, if we read in Ephesians 2, who is the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. Not our family, not our experience, not our feeling, not our actions. Jesus is the cornerstone. And sometimes you guys have to know that when you're behind closed doors. Not only Sunday church time and Bible study time. When you are alone, please understand, Jesus is still the cornerstone. He still is and He has always been. Your life is in reference to Him. Your life is built in reference to Him. Whatever career you're taking on, whatever challenge you're going through, guess what? You should look at it in reference to Jesus Christ, not only to you. Look at what the Lord is telling you. Okay? Your, our identity, your identity is in Christ Himself. This, the prophets, the apostles, all those other people, right? This is you right here. Guess who connects them? It's Jesus. Jesus is the one that connects the Jewish heritage to us. Moses to us. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the reason why we have any hope at all. Okay, let's verse, move on. Verse 21, still in Ephesians chapter 2. In Jesus, in Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. One more time. In Christ, the whole building, the whole building includes you, you individual person. He's also talking about you. And the reason why you, may, you might wonder, Chris, why is Brian saying that all the time about you? Because the reason why is that was what's been in my heart is I want to let you know that the Lord is trying to build you up, not just other people up. He's talking about you, your life, building you up as a person whose identity is in Christ. He's trying to build you up. Does he care about your career? Definitely, 100% he cares about your career. So why don't you come to him? Why don't you talk to him about your career, your worries? But focus on him. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, help me find you. I'm lost, Lord Jesus. Bring me back to you. Come back to him. Because he's the cornerstone. Your career isn't. Your day is not the cornerstone. How you feel is not the cornerstone. Giving to 200 people, money to 200 people is not the cornerstone of your faith. The, the cornerstone of your faith is one person and one person only. It's not your grandfather, it's not your dad, your mom. It's not your family. It's Jesus. He is the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building, that is us, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Remember what Jesus said? Break this down. I'll rise it up in three days. This is what Paul was talking about years later. That's what Jesus did, and he's preaching the same message. He's saying, you tear this down. Do whatever you want to it. I'm gonna, all that is going to happen to me. All that punishment and sin is going to be put on me. I'm going to carry the cross. I'm going to die for you. 
so I can raise you up. Guys, you have a chance of victory. Why? Not because you're strong, not because you're good. It's because Jesus is your chance. Jesus Christ is your chance. Let me tell you, as a leader, as a leader, guys, please don't think just because I speak, we preach up here, we're any better than you. We struggle with the same struggle that you're struggling with. Doubts, unfaithfulness, self-perception. We struggle with all that, guys. But let me tell you, what does help is when Jesus, we understand who, I understand who I am in Christ. When I understand myself in Christ, that helps a whole lot. Why? Because Jesus took care of it. It's not about me. It's always been about Him. This whole trip to the Philippines, to Korea, you know what it was about? It was about Him. <laughs> you know that trip to the Korea and the Philippines? All those friends are going to come and go. The experience is going to come and go. The one that doesn't change is the cornerstone. The cornerstone, everything that I'm experiencing is in reference to Jesus. And I hope you guys understand everything that Pastor Ilano did, that Cuyo Marlo did, that my grandfather did, that your parents did is in reference to Jesus. Anything good they did was in reference to Christ. Not because they're good people, not because they're family, not because we love them. It's, in, it's set in reference to the cornerstone. The cornerstone. The most important part of the building. I hope everyone, visitors and people who've been coming to vessels, hear this out clearly. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. It's bigger than your family name. You are a Christian, Christ-centered. But Brian, I'm not good. Amen. Neither am I. But you know what? Jesus is my hope. Don't look at me as an old Christian. You know, you're trying to, yeah, you're holier than thou. Stop with the holier than thou stuff. What does that mean anymore? Don't use that as an excuse, holier than thou. I'm not doing that. That's you speaking to you. You got to start looking yourself in the mirror and know that you see a child of the living God. You are a child of the living God. Jesus died for you. Not, he didn't only die for everyone around you. He died for you. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus took the punishment for me, for you. He took care of all of that for you. You have to know that, guys, and be reminded of that and be encouraged that He's the cornerstone. You don't have to play the cornerstone. You don't have to carry all that stuff. Jesus did already, and He's still doing it. He's still doing that. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in Jesus and in Him, verse 22, and in Him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. And in Him you, there's an individual, I'm calling everyone out, God's calling me out, He's calling Francisco out, He's calling Hannah out, Ryan, every single individual here. You know, Brian, Christian, I haven't been walking with the Lord. You know, not of my business. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not God. But you know what God's doing? He's calling you out right now. He's calling you out right now. He says, in Him, in Christ, you, you too are being built together. Why? To become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. You mean something, guys, because guess where His Spirit lives? Guess where His Spirit dwells? In you. Is your body clean? Is the temple of the Lord clean? You can say, Ah, Brian, man, my body's not that clean. What I've been doing is not that clean. What did Jesus say? Break this down. I'll raise this up in three days. That was 2015 years ago. It's done. You have to learn that, guys, and be reminded, Christians, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, it's always been about Him, and He did it for you already. So don't give up. Forgive. Love. Shine for the Lord. Why? Because you're good? Because you're not good? No. 
not because of your actions and how you feel. It's because of what Jesus did for us. What he did for us. What Jesus Christ is for us. That's why you shine for him. May the Lord bless you with John chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 2. May the Lord bless you with his word. Um, can I ask, um, we're going to end, that was the end of my message. Um,